Sri Lanka is committed to achieving the 2030 Agenda. We are home to 22 million people of diverse cultures, languages and ethnicities, endowed with a magnificent coastline and glorious mountains, waterfalls and rivers, blessed with a tropical climate and highly enriched biodiversity. The cradle of ancient civilizations and hydraulic technological marvels. South Asia's oldest democracy with universal adult franchise since 1931. Through separatist terrorism, sporadic civil unrest and economic downturns, our citizens have exercised their franchise. Sri Lanka is an early achiever of the MDGs and on track to achieving ISDG commitments, placing 76 out of 163 countries in SDG achievements in 2022, with an overall country score well above the regional average. Inclusive transformation towards a sustainably developed nation for all is what we envision. Integrate SDGs into national and sectoral policies and strengthen institutional mechanisms at the national and sub-national levels. We establish the Sustainable Development Council for the coordination, implementation and monitoring of the 2030 Agenda. Increase data availability on SDG indicators from 46 in 2017 to 106 in 2022. Sri Lanka has achieved 72nd place out of 189 countries in the Human Development Index ranking in 2020. 97% of Sri Lanka's over 12-year-olds were vaccinated against COVID-19. Sri Lanka had 99.99% proportion of births attended by skilled health personnel. Sri Lanka had 90% primary, 87% lower secondary and 81% upper secondary education completion rates respectively. The proportion of women in managerial positions in Sri Lanka increased to 25.6% from 22.5%. 90% of households have access to safe drinking water. Sri Lanka initiated a 10-year national action plan on plastic waste management and banned the usage of single-use polythene and plastics. Sri Lanka is committed to increasing 32% of its forest cover. Marine plastic litter accumulated at one kilometer has decreased to 92.5 kilograms per kilometer from 103 kilograms per kilometer in 2017. The SDGs will power the transition of Sri Lanka through production-based economic diversification, harnessing a blue-green economy, led by strategies for protecting biodiversity and combating climate change, creating a knowledge-based and technology-driven workforce, ensuring social inclusivity, public sector reform and innovation, strengthening law enforcement rights protection. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the launch of the SDG Investor Maps for Sri Lanka, an initiative of SDG Impact of UNDP in partnership with the Sustainable Development Council. Also collaborating for the launch event is the Board of Investments of Sri Lanka, the Apex Investment Promotion Agency. The Sri Lanka Investor Map has been developed through a consultative process with the support of our knowledge partner, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, with 50 plus government stakeholders, think tanks, enterprises, leading impact and commercial investors to produce tangible market intelligence. I'm Afra Mohammed, a policy research and engagement associate at UNDP, and I will be your host for this afternoon. Before we move on to our main agenda item for this afternoon, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Firstly, we have simultaneous translations um, in Sinhala and Tamil taking place, so please do make use of this if needed. For our participants joining online, there's a Q&A box in operation throughout, so please submit your questions to our panelists who, and they may endeavor to answer at the later discussion. Engage with us on social media. We have a dedicated hashtags for the map, uh, for the launch of the map. To our speakers and panelists, given that we're running on a very tight schedule this afternoon, and to ensure a seamless flow, we would appreciate if your interventions are limited to the times allocated. 
a compounding sequence of global and national shocks has led to Sri Lanka's current complex economic crisis, which requires a set of immediate and comprehensive long-term responses. Despite having made great strides in poverty reduction in the recent years, the current crisis is significantly impacting the lives of the poor and the vulnerable. All these developments threaten the country's considerable progress towards the SDGs, and they confirm the need to prioritize an inclusive recovery and strengthen institutions as part of the re reform pathway. The role of private capital and investment is now more important than ever to support recovery, to prevent regression, and to help reaccelerate towards a sustainable development trajectory for the country. The SCG Investor Map is an important market intelligence product that provides insights and tools for the private sector to increase their investments towards the SDGs. This will further contribute to the government of Sri Lanka's efforts to establish a more holistic public and private approach to national sustainable development. So today's conversation will feature a diverse lineup of speakers from Sri Lanka and overseas who will bring their unique experiences to set the tone and spark conversation, mobilizing private capital to drive impactful socioeconomic recovery for Sri Lanka. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Her Excellency Hana Singha Hamdi, the United Nations Resident Coordinator for Sri Lanka. She leads the UN country team of 22 resident and non-resident agencies and is the representative of the United Nations Secretary General in Sri Lanka. Her Excellency has over three decades of experience with the UN, within the UN, having, across, uh, having worked across development and humanitarian contexts at various senior management and strategic leadership roles. I now call upon Her Excellency Hana Singha Hamdi to deliver the welcome remarks. Thank you very much. Mr. Sarath Kumar, Deputy Secretary, Treasury, Ministry of Finance. Ms. Shamindri Saparamandu, DG, SDG Council. Ms. Renuka Wirakonim, DG, BOI, whom I just discovered that we went to school together something like uh, <clears throat> long years ago. Thank you very much. And my dear colleague and friend, uh, Malin Herwig, officer in charge of UNDP, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, great friends uh, uh, attending today, thank you so much. All the representatives from the government, private sector, civil society, and development partners joining us uh, today, both physically and online. It is an honor to join you today, this afternoon, for the launch of the SDG Investor Map for Sri Lanka. Now, the SDG Investor Map is really the first of its kind of Sri Lanka, is the culmination of an al almost nine months long process led by the fantastic team of UNDP and their national partners, the Sustainable Development Council. Always a pleasure, really, to follow up this partnership. Now, at a time of intense national need, it is a market intelligent tool that will help light the way forward by guiding private ca uh, capital to where Sri Lanka's sustainable development goals, uh, priorities, uh, government policy, and market opportunities intersect. Now, as you know, financing the SDGs in Sri Lanka could not be a more urgent task. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, Sri Lanka, like most other countries, were really on a challenging track to realize the Agenda 2030. Now, the COVID-19 widened the SDG financing gap considerably because it shifted funds towards response and recovery efforts and away from the global goals. And it also added pressure to weakness in uh, Sri Lankan economy that have caused public debt to climb to 140% of the GDP. We don't have to look far to see the toll of the economic crisis is taking in terms of the food and medicine shortage affecting millions of our Sri Lankan citizens today. 
And as with the pandemic, it is those already most at risk of being left behind who are suffering the most adverse effects. The SDGs were designed to ensure all people can live prosperous and fulfilling lives and to ensure that no one is left behind. A massive whole of society effort is now needed to bring them back on course and to ensure Sri Lankan's long-term sustainable development. That effort must involve all of us, the government, the development partner, and the civil society. Today, as we launch the SDG Investor Map, I want to talk about the way forward, and in particular about the role of the private sector in helping us navigate our way out of the crisis and contributing to a sustainable future for all Sri Lankans that leaves no one behind. Economic recovery and financing of the SDG requires resources from across the spectrum, from the IMF program Sri Lanka is pursuing, to foreign uh, direct investment, to blended finance options, to private and public partnership. Private capital is a key part of that mix. The private sector in Sri Lanka has a history of stepping up in times of hardship. Whether there's a rebuilding after the Indian tsunami, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, addressing the impacts of COVID-19, or supporting socioeconomic recovery for some of the most vulnerable communities in the country. And the Sri Lankan SDG investor map offers a compelling pathways to increase private financing for the SDG because it translates country level SDG gaps and priorities into an investment opportunities that can have long lasting impacts on lives and livelihoods across the country. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, when we consider that we require an estimated $2.5 trillion per year to close the SDG financing gap in developing countries alone, it can seem overwhelming. But let's not lose sight of the fact that there are enough financial assets in the world to meet the financing needs of Agenda 2030. The challenge is how to channel those resources through SDGs related sectors that generate sustained impact on the ground. So the SDG investor map offers one response to this challenge by providing intelligence that helps the private sector align investment decisions with the SDG policies. It is the product of more than 50 consultations with members of the public and private sector, academic uh, and financial institutions. Indeed, the map complements the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework 2023 to 2027, which I had the honor to officially launch a few weeks back, together with the government of Sri Lanka. So the Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework is structured around four mutually reinforcing strategic priorities. One, inclusive and equitable human development and well-being. Two, resilient and uh, green recovery, third is social cohesion, and fourth, inclusive governance and justice and gender equality. Meanwhile, the SDG investor map has identified 15 investment opportunities areas across five SDG priority sectors, healthcare, renewable energy, food and beverages, infrastructure and consumer goods. It can serve, again, as a market intelligent tool for investors and enterprise, as well as for the government. Because helping private sector capital flow into the SDG-related investment at scale will require policy and regulatory shifts, better access to information, and clear standards on the criteria for identification of the SDG alignment investment. So the challenge ahead of us is considerable. 
but both the new Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework and the SDG Investor Map provides us with the practical framework to help us build a better, more inclusive future. And they both demonstrate, ladies and gentlemen, the UN's steadfast commitment to supporting Sri Lanka's economic recovery and sustainable development. And as I always like to end my speeches with, especially in these challenging situations, by saying, yes, we can, and yes, can do. Best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Her Excellency Hana Singha Hamdi, for your insightful remarks. Indeed, we need to bring everyone together to ensure that systemic change is being embedded and to work across all sectors to ensure uh, inclusive recovery measure. Our chief guest for this afternoon is Mrs. Sarat Kumara, Deputy Secretary Treasury for the Ministry of Finance. Mrs. Sarat Kumara is a senior executive officer in the public service who has over 36 years of experience in the Sri Lanka accountant service, and he assumed his duties as a deputy secretary on the 1st of August. Prior to being released for his role uh, to the treasury, he worked at the prime minister's office in the capacity of chief financial officer over seven years. Over to you, Mrs. Sarat Kumara. Okay, well, good afternoon to all of you, Ms. Hana Singer Hamdi, United Nations uh, Resident Coordinator, Sri Lanka, Ms. Malin Hervey, Officer in Charge of UNDP Sri Lanka and other UNDP colleagues from the UNDP Sri Lanka Country Office and the Global and Regional Officers, Mr. Chamindri Saparamadu, Director General and members of other staff of the Sustainable Development Council in Sri Lanka, Ms. Renuka Virakon, Director General and other members of the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka. This invite is ladies and gentlemen. I am here on behalf of the Secretary of the Treasury. It gives me great pleasure to address you this afternoon as we launch Sri Lanka's first ever SDG investor map, commencing a new chapter in the financial landscape in Sri Lanka to drive private capital inflows towards the sustainable development goal. Sri Lanka's commitment to achieving the SDG is very clear in our continued pursuit of national policies and development plans and programs in line with the SDGs over the years. This makes sure Sri Lanka achieves steady progress of the SDGs during the challenges that the country has to face in recent years. According to the 2022 Global Sustainable Development Report, the country's improved score of 70 has placed Sri Lanka well above the regional average of 65.9 and the country's global ranking of SDGs has also been continually improving. It is the aim of the government of Sri Lanka to ensure that these hard-earned development outcomes are not reversed due to the economic and other challenges facing us in the post-pandemic era. Needless to say, financial for SDGs remain a critical challenge given the limited fiscal space in the national budget. To address the current fiscal position of the country, the government has already taken several important policy measures such as curtailing unproductive and unnecessary expenses of the government and various revenue enhancement measures. In line with this, the government has also initiated a debt restructuring process with the aim of getting a workable solution over the debt service payment issues of the country with the support of creditors and reverting the country's sustainable debt level in the medium term. Discussion for a possible IMA program have, been, have also been initiated and technical level discussion are currently underway. It is expected that once the IMA program is completed, the investor competence will be restored, encouraging the investment in capital and debt markets. For the country to address the additional challenges related to financing the SDG implementation in the middle of the large external debt burden, coordinated 
effort to diversify and deepen finance in the SDGs. Particularly expand the private investment, both domestic and foreign, in a sustainable manner would be important. Innovative financial mechanisms become imperative to synergize the government, private sector, and the capital markets to generate, generate the additional resource needed to finance the SDGs. The SDG investor map is per, per the, uh, therefore a timely invent, intervention that would provide the potential invest, investors and the required market information related to potential uh, investment opportunity areas. The identified priority sectors such as renewable energy, food and beverages, healthcare, consumer goods and infrastructure are very much in line with the Sri Lanka's uh, strategic development priorities and in enhanced private capital inflows towards these sectors would surely support our economic recovery effect while responding to our sustainable development needs. The government is concerned that investment do not flow without a favorable policy, legal and institutional environment. Therefore, we hope to leverage on a comprehensive approach addressing the legal regulatory procedural and institutional barriers affecting all phases of the investment life cycle to establish a competitive investment climate. The government has already turned its attention to streamline FDI inflows and made proposals to review the procedures adopted by BOI to facilitate FDI inflows. Furthermore, we are taking steps to restructure significant number of SOEs owing to poor performance and badly done balance sheet, which have further aggravated the economic and fiscal cost of COVID-19 for the country. Already the cabinet has approved the proposal to restructure the Ceylon Electricity Board, powering the transition towards clean and alternative energy in line with the NDC commitment. In conclusion, I would like to admire this excellent partnership between UNDP and Sustainable Development Council and the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka and congratulate them in creating the first ever SDG investor map in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Have a great evening. We thank Mrs. Sarat Kumara for taking the time and joining us virtually despite being engaged with the interim budget reading proceedings in the parliament today. Bringing a global perspective to our discussion today, our keynote speaker, Mr. Marcos Nito, will be focusing on harnessing the power of the SDGs for recovery and development. The director of UNDP's new sustainable finance hub, Mr. Marcos Nito has led the development of UNDP's new private sector strategy and its offers on SDG finance. He co-chairs the executive boards of Business Call to Action and the Connecting Business Initiative. Over the past 25 years, he has been the leader in a sustainable development, poverty eradication, and multi-stakeholder partnership building. He's a passionate advocate for the sustainable development goals. Without further ado, I now invite Mr. Marcos Nito to deliver his remarks. Good afternoon to you all. I am and when I come, um, I'm coming to you from New York City. It's a pleasure to join you all today. The progress made on the SDGs in Asia, home to 4.7 billion people, or about 60% of the world population, we have a significant bearing on the global achievement of the SDGs. But on its current trajectory, the region may achieve less than 10% of its sustainable development goals targets. According to the Asian Development Bank, the number of people living in poverty in the region increased by 170 million in 2020 because of the global pandemic. Gender inequality was widespread across Asia before the pandemic it has worsened because of it and the economic distress faced by many countries in the region. Asia is also experiencing the impacts of climate change and will be disproportionately affected by its futures, as you can see in Pakistan right now. 
as governments and communities strive to find solutions to these complex development challenges, there's growing awareness that sustainable development is at the very heart of long-term value creation. That our future depends on the ecosystems in which we all live, work, produce, and sell. And sustainability related mega trends like climate change, biodiverse loss, environmental degradation, and increasing wealth inequality and rising social and geopolitical unrest are affecting societies and business in an unprecedented way and on a scale we've never experienced before. The sustainability is becoming a major business disruptor and competitive differentiated, creating both risks and opportunities. In an increasingly low economic growth environment, opportunity to create value will depend on the ability of the private sector to develop products, service, and solutions for unserved and undeserved markets that will lead to new customs, market opportunities, and accelerate innovation. In this context, as resources of governments become increasingly constrained, the issue of mobilizing private finance and the use of innovative financial solutions are becoming more prevalent in discussions around possible solutions. If we are to move the needle towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda to meet the SDGs, all finance and business should consider its combined economic, social, and environmental value as defined by the SDGs. The private sector needs to shift from a pursuit of profit single mindset to a profit with purpose approach and the public sector would systematically invest in sustainable development and support the shift in the private sector. We have a unique opportunity here to create a new normal and build forward better. To redefine what development means to us, to see the current crisis as an opportunity to recreate a future that is sustainable and equitable. The weight of the challenges we face need action today. Maintaining this status quo is no longer an option. This will be even more relevant in the Sri Lanka context, which is currently experiencing one of the worst economic crisis situation in its history. Despite strong progress in poverty reduction and social development in the preceding decades, we are also seeing other countries in the region, such as Pakistan and Nepal, start to experience economic distress. We estimate in the coming years more countries around the world could face similar crisis. Given the magnitude of the social economic crisis Sri Lanka's face, we need all players in market, government, regulators, private investors and business to band together, to close the financing gap and to build forward better. Indeed, the private sector, which with its creativity, innovation, determination, has a significant role to play in rebuilding a sustainable Sri Lanka. In order to support an effective and sustainable recovery in Sri Lanka, it is important to address all barriers that may impede the flow of finance to sustainable development and leverage opportunity to increase SDG investment at scale. Sri Lankan SDG investment map provides crucial market intelligence, providing much of the groundwork for private investors. Those who are looking for SDG investments can use the map to explore investment themes in the knowledge that they are aligned to the identify SDG needs in country and the government's development priorities, thereby strengthening the potential for deep sustainable development. Sri Lanka has a range of solutions that can be considered, including blended finance options to de-risk investments, concession financial solutions, debt swaps, and others that can encourage investors to SDG aligned investment opportunity areas. Today, my colleagues are going to present you the shares of the map that span social sectors such as education, healthcare. They are key to build community resilience as Sri Lanka embarks upon its recovery plans. We will also present opportunities in the economic sector, such as agriculture and consumer goods, where Sri Lanka has the skills and resources, and where, with adequate volume of investment, Sri Lanka can create significant and sustainable shareholder value, while also responding to key issues around food security and decent livelihood options. We will also hear about opportunities in renewable energy and the infrastructure sectors that will signify Sri Lanka's commitment to both the efforts towards a greener, responsible and energy future. As we launch this, as we launch this map today, UNDP and our collaborators, particularly the government partners like Sustainable Development Council, the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka, we recognize that our work with 
will only have started. This valuable market intelligence is the first step for us to plan for activities to create pathways for investments in Sri Lanka, bring together key actors for a stronger ecosystem to foster private sector growth and to ensure the sustainability is embedded into business as usual for everyone. We invited interested individuals, groups and organizations who would like to join this movement with us and work together towards a stronger, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Sri Lanka. Finally, UNDP with its global, regional and country level presence is working closely with government, civil society, private sector and communities. We are committed to a principle-led evidence-based approach to development and cooperation, promoting country ownership, inclusive partnerships, focus on results, not accountability and transparency. I would like to reaffirm the UNDP Sustainable Finance Hub support to our team in Sri Lanka, ongoing and future work on innovative development financing instruments, which with bolsters the interlink efforts taken by the governor of Sri Lanka and other institutions at this critical time. Thank you very much, and I wish you a great event, and more important than that, a great process to finding the necessary deals so the financial flows for the areas identified in the map can flow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nito, for your remarks, and we'd also like to thank you for joining us today, despite how early it is in your part of the world. Every day, more and more enterprises and investors are looking for straightforward ways to operate more sustainably and make a more positive impact towards the SDGs. Operating sustainably and contributing to the SDGs can help organizations use a common language um, and a shared purpose. The SCG Impact is a UNDP flagship initiative that plays a key role in guiding um, organizations on how they can translate intent to action. We now have Ms. Fabian Michaud, the director of UNDP SCG Impact, who will give us an introduction to the SCG Impact Standards and the SCG Investor Map. Fabian is the lead director, developer of the SDG Impact Standards, the first and only independent management standards in the market that places sustainability at its core. She's a working group member of the G7 Impact Ta uh, work Task Force, the co-chair of the Australian Advisory Board on Impact Investing, and recently co-chaired the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative Working Group on Making Better Decisions. She previously enjoyed a 30-year executive career, including 22 years with SNP Global Ratings, where in her final role, she was Australian country head and head of developed markets Asia Pacific. Over to you, Fabian. Thanks so much. And it's a pleasure to be, be um, with you this evening. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm really uh, happy to be joining the session. I'm going to share some slides, so just let me pull up my um pull up my screen there we go and uh, can i just check that you can see the slides Hopefully, yes, yes. Okay, fantastic. So, um, yes, I'm the um, the director of SDG Impact, which is a uh, initiative of the UNDP housed in the Sustainable Finance Hub. And you've just heard from my boss, uh, Marcos Neto. So, hi, Marcos. Um, the, uh, the 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 purpose of SDG Impact is really to focus on private sector activation uh, around catalyzing in private sector pack, um, capital towards the SDGs and broader sustainability aspirations. So our vision is a world where sustainability and the SDGs are at the heart of private sector value creation and, um, and move from being um, uh, an add-on to what business gets done to how all business gets done. The way that we're going about trying to make a contribution to that vision is, um, is through two main pillars. Uh, managing for impact pillar, where we've developed um, internal management standards, along with training and education, um, and uh, in progress, uh, the development of an assurance um, uh, framework and uh, SDG impact seal based on the standards. And as we'll hear a lot more about this evening, um, the SDG investor maps, so uh, market intelligence that provides uh, uh, valuable information on um, uh, how we can actually move financial flows to where they're needed most to achievement of the SDGs. 
So um, uh, the work is very much integrated both uh, across the standards and the SDG investor maps, but also with the broader work of UNDP and the, and the Sustainable Finance Hub um, uh, and the more traditional work that UNDP does with, um, with governments and policymakers and, um, and civil society on the ground. So firstly, just to give a little bit of background on um, the on the investor maps and um, and where you can find them, um, the investor maps is a method is based on a methodology that we developed about three years ago, uh, and it's very much a funnel methodology. So it has uh, eight main steps, but um, bucketed really in four key areas, as shown in this um, in this diagram here. Um, firstly, in the first in the first level, we really work to define the national priority starting points by distilling and comparing national development needs and national pri uh, policy priorities to identify sectors where there's a demonstrable po political financial commitment to stimulate development and investment. Once those national um, priority areas are identified, um, we move to the next level uh, and really look to identify the priority subsectors to focus on. So there we're really looking um, at where there's a development need and a policy investment momentum to, um, to make that opportunity happen. Um, we then look to identify the priority subregions um, where there's both high development need within each subsector and strong political financial momentum to spur potential subsector growth. And then finally from there we, we um, work to derive specific investment opportunity areas. So highlighting impactful business models uh, within priority subsectors and subgroups where new capital can facilitate scale and identify potential white spaces um, where new business models are most needed. So around um, each, uh, uh, each investor map and opportunity area, um, we pinpoint 20 actionable data points and, um, and provide that information um, through our SDG investor platform in, a, in an easily searchable format. To date, we've, um, we've completed 21 investor maps around the world and we have 22 uh, now in progress. Um, one of the things that we're finding as we produce more maps is that um, the aggregation of that information across um, across country maps um, uh, in terms of regions and also uh, sectors is becoming a really valuable um, uh, knowledge um, uh, uh, source. Uh, and I think you know all, all of us can appreciate for investors oftentimes uh, a pipeline and um, ability to um, uh, invest in areas where there's, uh, you know, where there's scale and pipeline opportunities is really important. So some of these regional and global um, insights are really important. And here uh, I'm showing um, some of that aggregation for Asia from the um, from the maps that we've already completed in South Asia, ASEAN, and East Asia. Um, the insights uh, so far from Asia at an aggregate level, I won't go into the insights from Sri Lanka because we'll hear about that in the next presentation, but, um, uh, but some of the, the, the key highlights are that 47% of the IOAs that have been um, identified across Asia um, document tech-based business solutions to ensure last mile reach of products and services. Um, significant evidence of successful investments, including of data on return profiles in social sectors like health healthcare and education, um, with the region being home to five of the largest emitters of um, GHG emissions. The maps also explore energy alternatives and clean technology to contribute to regenerative, regenerative business approaches. And um, finally, financial services is playing a key role to build resilience for low income segments, given that Asia has the largest regional share of microfinance, 42, 42.5% and some of the fastest growing internet economies. As mentioned before, all of the um, investment opportunity areas from the maps that we've completed can be found on the SDG investor platform, which is um, freely available and searchable. Um, there's, I think, now over 450 individual um, business models and investment opportunity areas that are highlighted on the maps. So really um, uh, encourage you to, to get online and have a look at that um, when, you have, um, when you have the time. Now I'm going to switch quite quickly to 
um, the other pillar of the work that we're doing around uh, managing for impact. And there we're really focused on the development of the internal management standards, as I mentioned before, the impact assurance and seal and education and training. So um, we have a free online course um, available through Coursera, which is called Impact Measurement and Management for the SDGs. Uh, we're just launching training on the SDG impact standards and um, we're also uh, working towards capacity building with a train the trainer program um, to enable market trainers to deliver training accredited training on the SDG impact standards and, uh, and, and an assurer training program related to the assurance framework is also under development. So with the standards um, uh, what we've we're really focusing on here is um, is a twofold change. Firstly, to um, help organisations make all capital uh, in the all private capital in the system, so the 100 plus trillion dollars um, of capital in the system more sustainable. Because if we don't do that, we're continuing to generate um, uh, problems at a faster rate than we're um, creating solutions um, out the other side. And then to really focus on targeting a portion of that capital to where it's needed most to filling the S. SDG financing gap um, and uh, achieving the SDGs. And we really think that that needs um, a transformational change in terms of um, and shift in terms of mindset and management decision making for both businesses and investors. And that what got us to where we are today is not going to get us to where we need to be. So managing for impact, uh, um, as you know, we've already heard this evening, is really around shifting the business and investment purpose to place sustainability at its core, um, and and really looking at how we can integrate sustainability, the SDGs, and managing for impact um, uh, at the heart of organisational internal management systems and decision making through the whole um, uh, through the whole of the business cycle. So through strategy, management approach, governance, and disclosure practices. With the standards, what we've done is um, is basically develop four sets of SDG uh, or four sets of standards, three sets um, uh, targeted towards the private sector uh, under the SDG impact standards banner, and a fourth set that we developed in partnership with the OECD um, for financing sustainable development that targets development um, capital. And that's really important because particularly around um, uh, targeting uh, a portion of the, the world's private capital towards um, where it's needed most and the achievement of the SDGs, probably there we need um, a more um, uh, you know, nuanced um, solutions that include blended finance solutions, development capital, um, reimagining of business models, etc. So, you know, the coming together of the um, the standards for um, financing sustainable development and the standards for private sector actors really helps create a shared language and approach um, to bring different actors together to work collaboratively towards um, towards uh, uh, financing solutions for the SDGs and sustainability more broadly. The SDG impact standards um, are a little bit different because they're not really trying to replace or replicate a lot of things that are out there. They're, they're really being developed to serve as an organising framework to complement and strengthen existing initiatives and, in, and um, fill gaps where we felt there were gaps that were undermining progress. So, um, so really the standards started with um, a lot of the high level principles that were already available in the market um, and are consistent with all of those and that's um, shown here in the blue box. And, um, um, and then integrate a number of um, existing frameworks uh, uh, and, and lean towards them, I guess, in terms of the standards um, uh, uh, in that grey box there, including things like the UN guiding principles, UNGC's um, global um, um, 10 principles, the UN women's empowerment principles, obviously the sustainable development goals, but also importantly, the, the impact management project shared norms um, and, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and you know, definitions that, um, that help to uh, drive convergence across, um, across the sector. And then really using that um, decision making framework will help users to determine um, from, from um, the perspective of the orange uh, orangey boxes at the bottom there, um, which, which impact management tools to use and to link in and create um, the internal data and information needed to feed external disclosure requirements. 
Um, the key components of the standards really revolve around, um, uh, as I said before, the, the strategy management approach, transparency and governance within organisations and focus very much on decision making. So they're not external reporting or performance standards, they're really internal management um, standards and complement, I guess, existing um, uh, reporting frameworks on the external reporting side. Um, we then funnel down to really focus on 12, 12 actions across those four themes and um, uh, and now all of the tools that we have in place really focus at, at this level on these 12 um, on these 12 actions um, uh, across enterprises as shown here but also for private equity funds and um, bond um, issuers. Um, there's a number of resources which are all um, freely available on our SDG Impact um, website and um, uh, in particular the self-assessment tool is really the anchor now, the, you know, all of the information about the standards and, and how to actually use the standards as an um, uh, internal um, uh, self-assessment tool to perform gap analysis and um, develop um, uh, develop improvement plans um, can be done from that um, uh, self-assessment um, tool. Uh, as mentioned before, we're also in the process of developing the assurance framework and SDG impact seal, and we should be piloting that later this year. I also mentioned earlier the impact measurement and management um, for the SDG course, which is available through Coursera and um, and free. The, con the access to the content is free. Uh, over 12,000 people have registered since we launched this last September, and um, the feedback's been uniformly excellent on the course. Um, and uh, and uh, we're currently in training in terms of um, uh, starting uh, training on the um, standards themselves. So um, we've run our first at launch that in, in Japan in July and launched our first train the trainer course and are in the process um, through an external trainer of conducting the first in-house training for Mizuho Bank in, in Japan. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, thank you very much and back to you. I'll try and work out how to get out the screen. Thank you Fabian for those insights and we'd also like to thank you for joining us despite the time difference. Next up, we have the presentation on the findings and the key insights of the SDG Investor Map for Sri Lanka by Mr. Shiran Fernando, Chief Economist of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and our Principal Consultant for this exercise. Before I invite Mr. Shiran Fernando on stage, I would like to direct your attention to the screen where a short video on the SDG Investor Map will be played. Sri Lanka today faces a dual challenge. The island is facing its most complex economic crisis in its post-independence history. Owing to a compounding of global market dynamics, a build-up of debt sustainability and balance of payment issues over the decades, along with the economic impacts of Easter Sunday attacks in 2019 and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic from 2020 onwards. Against this backdrop, the need to supplement government efforts by mobilizing private sector capital inflows to support Sri Lanka's economic recovery is key. Innovative financing solutions and strategies such as blended financing options and public-private partnerships will play a crucial role in attracting investments and contribute to the strengthening of the investment landscape in Sri Lanka. As per UNSCAP estimates in 2019, Sri Lanka needed to spend an additional 9% of GDP per year to achieve the SDGs by 2030. This gap in expenditure towards SDGs has certainly increased since then. To set the stage for accelerating the flow of private sector capital and to provide a tool to drive economic recovery and to advance the full implementation of SDGs, the United Nations Development Programme, together with the Sustainable Development Council of Sri Lanka, developed the SDG Investor Map. The Sri Lanka SDG Investor Map is a market intelligence tool that guides the private sector to identify investment themes which have significant potential to advance the SDGs, are aligned to government policies and are responsive to the national sustainable development needs. To ensure stakeholder-wide representation in developing the map, over 50 consultations were carried out with government ministries and institutions, sector-specific experts, local and regional investors, as well as think tanks. 15 immediate and medium-term investment opportunity areas 
eight subsectors across five priority sectors have been identified that are commercially viable and have the potential for deep development impact. Gender, climate and technology as a lever for scale are underpinning themes that were explored for every sector in line with Sri Lanka's policy push for gender equality and building a digital economy. The five sectors identified are renewable energy, healthcare, infrastructure, food and beverages, consumer goods. The Sri Lanka SDG Investor Map creates a sustainable path for the private and public sector to easily identify SDG-aligned investment opportunities and contribute towards building an inclusive and more resilient Sri Lanka. Good afternoon everyone and a warm uh, good afternoon to all the dignitaries and to all those present here as well as uh, those who are joining in online. Um, so I think the video gave an idea of kind of the overall um, some of the sectors that we've looked at but in the next few uh, minutes uh, I will kind of go through the process that we uh, went through and uh, got to this uh, stage and, and I think that will be the cue into our uh, panel discussion as well. Um, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with Sri Lanka, I think uh, just to give a little bit of context, of course the economic uh, crisis is in the backdrop, but uh, beyond that I think a lot of our indicators, uh, even uh, pre-pandemic and even the pre-economic crisis, uh, were looking quite good. Of course we are um, a 22 million economy, uh, under $4,000 uh, per capita. Um, though we've kind of uh, not really benefiting from the demographic dividend, there are potential opportunities uh, with what's going on on that aspect as well. Uh, we've seen FDI in the past peaking uh, beyond two billion uh, in certain years, close to about four to five percent of GDP. And uh, when it comes to some of the key uh, global rankings, uh, we do uh, stand out uh, from a South Asian perspective. So that's just a little bit of uh, the country context. Um, as, as Fabian, I think, mentioned about, a bit about the methodology, I think a key thing which uh, guided us through this process uh, was uh, these three lenses uh, to see whether a particular investment opportunity area or a specific uh, space was uh, fitting the SDG uh, need of the country uh, to see whether some of those will enable us to get to those 2030 targets uh, to see whether they were actually in line with the national priorities and, and this could mean government policy documents, regulation, gazettes, so on uh, and, and so forth and more importantly, to see whether there was a private sector interest in this, because oftentimes there might be a particular sector that is uh, really in need of investment, in need of, um, and, it, and the investment will propel or accelerate uh, the economy uh, or that sector to achieve uh, the SDG targets, but the sector is a, maybe a sector which the government is really investing in, and more needs to be done for the private sector to really uh, come in from a commercial uh, point of view. Uh, as highlighted uh, numerous times as well, uh, over the last 12 months we've uh, had the privilege to speak to a lot of uh, stakeholders, both within government, different institutions. I know some of you all are here with us as well, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with most of you all. And we also managed to speak to uh, certain uh, people even at a, um, at a regional level to see whether some of what we were thinking of for the map was resonating with some of their needs as well. Uh, leveraging on, on the Ceylon Chamber's industrial uh, network as well, we were able to speak to a cross-section of sectors um, uh, ranging from transport to healthcare uh, to waste management to see uh, whether our analysis of the other two lenses matched with uh, what we were thinking of from in, in terms of the private sector as well. And in the process, we've also spo spoken in particular at the start of the process to uh, with the think tanks and later on in the process with uh, investors both on the private equity side locally as well as certain foreign investment funds that have uh, some level of interest in Sri Lanka as well just to validate their views and assumptions uh, as well. Uh, so a lot of themes were driving um, uh, the SDG map. Uh, six months ago if I was to do this presentation some of these themes uh, might be uh, might not have been uh, relevant at that point but I think a lot of the things which came into the final analysis or the picture was really how can this uh, map be very relevant uh, from a 12-month perspective? How can 
it also be another tool which can help in the economic revival process. So we looked at what are the five key kind of uh, considerations. Of course, right now the key focus is on energy security, on food security, um, being able to maintain our key health uh, indicators as well because that's something that uh, Sri Lanka has been uh, known for and, and has done well in the past but could uh, decelerate uh, given uh, the economic situation. Uh, we also focused on, on the role that exports can really play in the medium to uh, long term as well and how can we find some enablers within this space to drive uh, exports as well. And then, of course, the, the regional element, the inclusivity element, uh, the gender uh, element as well to see whether some of these opportunities beyond a few pure profit play can really bring some societal uh, benefits as well. So overall, we are looking at these five sectors, renewable energy, um, food and beverage, which covers agriculture, healthcare, uh, infrastructure, which really looks at waste management, uh, consumer goods, which really looks at the apparel side of it and, and really strengthening um, our fabric manufacturing domestically. All these sectors uh, have mapped out the relevant SDGs that will have an impact. And of course, um, a lot of these sectors have cross-cutting uh, SDGs as well, and, and we've looked at SDG 1, 4, 5, um, 8, and even 10, which uh, have elements within it uh, across these uh, sectors as well. So we went from the five sectors to eight sub subsectors you just saw a few minutes uh, a few uh, minute back to the 15 um, opportunity areas, investment opportunity areas. And if you look at it, um, and, and if you look at where a chunk of it is, uh, six out of the 15 are within the renewable energy space. And I think this uh, underscores, of course, the current need, as well as the opportunity uh, that lies and, and a lot of private sector interest within it as well. Um, so we've, we are seeing a lot of uh, movement in particular now on, on the energy side, on, on solar and wind, uh, and, and they are to get to the targets that the government has, has put in place will really require a lot more addition of these two uh, energy sources, which uh, the private sector, and, and of course there's a lot of private sector uh, players within this field as well who would uh, be looking to invest, and, and, and there's a lot of opportunity for different uh, types of financing to come in as well. Um, with the, the, the situation that we saw with, in particular uh, with the, with the uh, domestic gas crisis and, and the inability to secure funding, we. We really looked at the opportunity that maybe biofuels could play, and we saw that as not a single opportunity, but as an opportunity to look at all parts of the value chain, from the plantation side of it, to um, really creating uh, the collection side of it, to then having more improved cook stoves, to maybe the thermal applications of it. So we feel there are a lot of opportunities um, in, this, in this whole um, value chain, uh, which, uh, which, ca which can be looked at. And, it will also strengthen um, our regional uh, resilience as well as some of the urban um, resilience given the dependencies we've had on, on sourcing it from other import dependent uh, needs as well. So renewable energy has been a key focus. The other sector which has really uh, had a key focus has been the food and beverage, the agricultural sector. Here the first two really are enablers to drive our key agricultural exports which are almost a quarter of our total uh, export basket. Um, we've also identified the need for cold chain, and I think this was something that um, was identified very early on, even under the, uh, the World Bank Modern Ag uh, Agricultural Program as well. Uh, and a lot of studies, for example, have been done, but unfortunately we've not seen too much of investment beyond a few uh, retail firms uh, investing in it for their supply chain. And then really focusing on a sector which is growing, which is our overall uh, fish-related uh, and aquaculture-related ex exports as well. Uh, and this is an area where the private sector also has ambitions to drive it to a billion and even more uh, dollar export um, uh, uh, export uh, sector as well. And, and of course, there needs to be certain investments uh, on the ground as well as in the value chain, which which is needed to get us there as well. So really, for focusing uh, both in terms of improving productivity yield um, and and overall resilience in the in the food on the food side of it as well. Uh, then, of course, we looked at healthcare, uh, and I think there was a lot of um, opportunities here uh, to really uh, come in as well. But in the immediate need, I think we, we saw how uh, the pandemic and uh, even recent times has exposed our, our need or dependency on a lot of uh, imported 
medicines and other 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 factors and other devices, for example, in uh, in this sector as well. So how can we go from producing 15% of, of our need to at least to 40% of our needs, which is what uh, the industry and I think policymakers are looking at. And this requires uh, investments as well. There are uh, zones, uh, there's a zone identified by the BUI, and of course, uh, even outside the zone, I think investors are, are looking keenly at this as well. And the second focus is really how can um, we uh, put a stent to the brain drain that we're sort of seeing in, in a lot of sectors, and in particular in healthcare, uh, where a lot of nurses and other uh, allied health workers are, are getting attracted to go overseas uh, and, and go to other markets as well. And here as well, we do see a lot of business models coming up with the opportunity to uh, supplement uh, both the domestic market and maybe after a while, uh, we can even look at this as a, a key skilled uh, export of services as well. Uh, when we look at the consumer goods side, I think it's a whole uh, overall bucket of a, of, of a sector, but we're specifically looking at the fabric and, and textile manufacturing. Um, there, there also we see uh, the potential to develop through the zone, but also I think even outside as well there might be opportunities. And here really it, it's to ensure that uh, Sri Lanka has more value add here so that, for example, we're able to leverage on existing things like the GSP Plus scheme because a uh, lot of our exports, our, our apparel exports, don't go through the scheme and, and we're not fully benefited because we fall under the local value at uh, threshold as well. So this is uh, another opportunity and also from a regional perspective as well. And if you look at infrastructure, really it's, it's on the solid waste management side of it. Uh, there's a lot of a regional element here as well, in particular when you look at the material recovery facilities. Uh, we've, all, we've seen close to about four, and four to five already announced uh, by the private sector, and, and we see a pipeline of about 30 um, MRFs that are required uh, in the next few years, and, and that will help in the distribution and the collection and uh, recycling of uh, plastic waste, and, and complements a lot of the policy-related uh, initiatives that have taken place in the last few years uh, by the Ministry of Environment as well. Uh, so in short, those are the 15 um, IOAs, or investment opportunity areas, um, in terms of some high-level insights, I think uh, more than 50% of the uh, business models are looking at funding over of, of, a, of 1 million uh, US dollars. A lot of that is in more cap, uh, capital-intensive related sectors like renewable energy, uh, some in terms of healthcare and, and uh, even on the uh, fabric manufacturing side of it. In terms of, in, in terms of the time frame, I think uh, you, you're seeing that two-thirds of it is in the medium term, which is 5 to 10, 5 to 15 years. Um, but really, uh, that's the return time that an investor will require, but I think a lot of these projects or uh, investment areas can bring um, uh, returns or uh, benefits or social benefits uh, within a 12 to 24 month period as well. And from an impact uh, management uh, project classification, I think uh, we uh, are seeing close to about two thirds of it having uh, contributing to solutions and only just one third of it really uh, benefiting stakeholders. So. A lot of these, um, from an impact position or impact investing point of view, are also quite positive. A lot of the IOAs um, are focused on those initial five themes I mentioned, on, on energy security, on uh, food security, on healthcare, and in particular on exports and the need to drive exports either directly or indirectly as well. And uh, we are seeing it also being um, inclusive in nature. In particular, some of our IOAs related to waste management, related to healthcare we see, um, really, a lot of the, the talent coming uh, from uh, from a rural uh, from the rural side of it coming into maybe urban areas and and getting uh, skilled uh, skilled jobs as well, um, and even on the agricultural side, uh, we really see uh, the need to drive uh, yield and productivity, which is something that uh, the sector has not been able to do for a long time. And some of those IOAs will help uh, in in driving that uh, that agenda as well. And of course, technology, which is uh, which underscores a lot of the IOAs. Uh, that we've uh, mentioned as well. Um, you must be wondering, there are a lot of other opportunities, why aren't they there? Uh, that's something that we oftentimes debated as well. So there were 16 other opportunity areas that we uh, were looking at uh, as well, but we took a view to see what can have an impact within the next 12 months, uh, while some of the others might be more medium to long term, and, and maybe in, in subsequent uh, updates of this, of this investor map, we can really look to see whether those can be positioned uh, in as well. And oftentimes, a lot of these were white spaces as well. 
going back to what I said earlier, some of these opportunity areas may not be ripe for the private sector because policy or regulation is still not favorable. So some of these areas could mature and, and might be investable uh, in the next, um, in the next uh, few iterations of the investor map as well. And these are areas that I, th I think UNDP and, and, and the chamber can uh, look, at uh, look at in terms of policy advocacy as well. Uh, what you will see on the investor map are these kind of details. So it's an intelligence tool which provides uh, an understanding. So for example, this is a sample one on renewable energy, on solar power generation. Uh, we look at the SDGs which are directly impacted, which are, not di which are indirectly impacted. We provide the business model uh, from what is going on presently in the, in the industry. Uh, we look at some of the risk factors uh, because we want to provide the entire picture to investors as well and uh, look at some of the key enabling factors um, provided in as well. And this is another example of the cold chain uh, storage for agriculture related investment opportunity which provides uh, similar the 20 data points that uh, Fab mentioned in her presentation as well. Uh, so a lot of this is, is will be on the investor map as well and I'm sure all of you got a brochure as well as you came in, uh, and, and uh, those, uh, this covers, uh, in short, uh, what I've just explained to you as well. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity, and uh, thank you uh, to the members of the research team at the, at the Ceylon Chamber as well for, for all their work done in presenting it. I've had the honor of uh, presenting it, but a lot of the hard work were done uh, by them as well, so thank you very much. Thank you, Shiran, for the presentation and for all the hard work that you and the team have put in over the past year. Now for the main agenda item for this afternoon, the ceremonial launch of the SDG Investor Map for Sri Lanka. With over 30 countries at various stages of development and to date with over 350 plus investment opportunity areas in 21 countries covering a wide range of sectors have been uploaded on the global SDG Investor Map platform. And we're excited that the Sri Lanka SDG Investor Map will also now be part of this. To carry out the launch, I would like to invite the following dignitaries to the stage. Her Excellency Hana Singha Hamdi, the United Nations Resident Coordinator for Sri Lanka. Ms. Chamindri Saparamadu, Director General of the Sustainable Development Council. Ms. Renuka Virakhorn, Director General of the Board of Investments. Mr. Manjula De Silva, CEO, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Marlin Hervig, Officer in Charge, UNDP Sri Lanka. Ms. Dulani Sirisena, SDG Integration Specialist, UNDP Sri Lanka. Mr. Shiran Fernando, Chief Economist and Principal Consultant from Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. To access the full Sri Lanka map, please scan the QR code at the back of the brochure which that all of you have in your hand right now. It will direct you to the Sri Lanka page or you can access www.investormap.sdg.lk to access the Sri Lanka map and also other investor maps uploaded by the different countries. I'd like to thank the dignitaries. You can now make your way to your seats. Now over to Ms. Dulani Sirisena, SDG Integration Specialist at UNDP and moderator for today's panel discussion. Over to you, Dulani, to take us through the next segment.
Thank you, Afra, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good evening to all of you joining us uh, online from various locations. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us today. Um, our panel discussion today will focus on mobilizing private capital for um, impactful socioeconomic uh, recovery in Sri Lanka. Uh, financing recovery and resilience uh, requires a financing ecosystem that can provide adequate and affordable finance to meet our enormous development needs. For this, we will need a multi-sourced, multi-instrument framework that embeds appropriate governance and regulatory frameworks to develop strong markets with full investor confidence. Establishing such a financing system will require accessing funds from both the public as well as the private sectors and from multiple financial institutions uh, to allow a blending of concessional and non-concessional funds and engineering instruments to meet different purposes uh, while being coherent over time. While many investors, corporates, and financial institutions are committed to the SDGs, we see globally that capital is not flowing fast enough into SDG-oriented uh, investments in countries where it would make the most difference. As the speakers before me uh, outlined, the SDG investor map clearly lays out uh, some of the investment opportunities for Sri Lanka uh, that enable the SDGs uh, and have potential to create deep development impact in the country and support the recovery process. It provides pathways for accelerating the flow of private capital into the country to drive economic recovery. Six out of the investment opportunity areas that you saw uh, in the presentation earlier uh, focus on the theme of energy security. Four of them on food security, two on healthcare, and six investment opportunities focus on exports. These are all areas that will drive recovery in Sri Lanka, and this is exactly why it's important to uh, look into them. Um, in order to uh, go through our topic uh, today and uh, launch the panel discussion, uh, I would like to call uh, our distinguished panelists onto the stage. Um, we have quite a diverse group of panelists joining us today. Um, we have uh, first uh, Ms. Chamindri Saparamadu, Director General uh, of the Sustainable Development Council of Sri Lanka. Um, as the CEO of the Council, Chamindri provides leadership to the institution to execute it, its functions uh, relating to facilitation, coordination, monitoring and evaluation of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. Uh, she's a lawyer by profession and has over 15 years of experience in the development uh, sector, including uh, with the UN system. Chamindri, please do join us on stage. Our second panelist today is uh, Ms. Renuka Virakon, uh, Director General of the Sri Lanka Board of Investment. Over there, Chami. Um, Renuka is also an attorney at law by profession, counting over 31 years of experience. Prior to her role as Director General, uh, she has a 27-year-long career uh, with the BOI, and she has served in many roles, uh, including as Executive Director Project Monitoring and as Board Secretary. Uh, Renuka, please do join us. Thank you. Our third panelist is uh, Mr. Rajendra Triagaraja. Um, who is best described as someone who wears many hats. Uh, he's an independent non-executive director in a diverse portfolio of listed and unlisted companies, including multinationals, and has extensive experience spanning several decades in the banking and financing sector. Um, he is also a past chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and has been engaged with the chamber um, for over a decade. Uh, Mr. Tyagraja, please join us. Thank you. 
Our next panelist, uh, Kamal Durabavila, is Principal Investment Officer at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. Uh, most recently, he has led IFC's power and energy financing activities in South Asia and has extensive experience leading project and corporate debt transactions and equity investments. He has led the development of pioneering projects in power generation, liquefied natural gas, LNG, oil and gas, and waste management, as well as infrastructure PPPs, including the first LNG project in Bangladesh, the largest private sector investment in Nepal, and the first ever PPP in Afghanistan. Kamal, please join us on stage. In addition to the panelists from Sri Lanka, we are very privileged to have two panelists joining us from the Asia Pacific region. The first is Jonathan Abevikrama, Vice President Impact Partners uh, of the Impact Investment Exchange, IIX, a pioneer organization in impact investing with a focus on Asia and specific experience in gender lens investing. Uh, Jonathan is a fund manager, treasury and investment banking expert, uh, and he leads the company's corporate finance work, uh, assisting impact enterprises globally raise capital through debt and equity. Our final panelist today joins us online from Mumbai, uh, Lavanya Jairam, Executive Director South Asia at Asia Venture Philanthropists Network, AVPN which is Asia's largest social investing network. Uh, Lavanya leads the efforts in establishing AVPN in South Asia, um, and she works across the board with corporates, foundations, trusts, uh, impact funds, and development finance institutions. Uh, she's also the co-author of two books, including one in 2021 called Accelerating Digital Success, which looks at how we can reimagine organizations in a post-COVID world. Lavanya, welcome and thanks for joining us online. Before we commence our panel discussion today, a few quick housekeeping um, rules. Uh, first to the panelists, uh, we have a lot to cover and many diverse views today, so I would very much appreciate if you would keep to time. Uh, to the participants, uh, we will have roving microphones uh, in the hall for participants here with us today. So when we go into the Q&A, please do raise your hand uh, and we will get one to you. Uh, for the many participants joining us online, uh, the Q&A box is now active, so please keep sending those questions in. To start the discussion today, I would like to pose a question to all of the panelists for your opening remarks. And I would like you to offer your own unique uh, opinion on this based on your background. Um, also, if you could uh, reflect on some of the findings uh, that were presented by Shiran and the team previously in terms of the findings of the map, that would be helpful. Um, so the question I have for the panelists is, what is the role private capital can play in Sri Lanka's uh, recovery and development process? How will it contribute to addressing some of Sri Lanka's more complex sustainable development challenges? Uh, if we could uh, keep your remarks to two minutes, that would be great, and then we can follow up uh, in the, pre uh, the next rounds. Uh, we'll start off maybe with uh, Chamindri from the Sustainable Development Council uh, to set the scene. Thank you, Dulani. So one of the most uh, significant shifts uh, with the development of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has been the foregrounding of the private sector, the role of the private sector in the development process. Now, um, private sector is no more seen as a profit, just a profit-making entity, but also uh, increasingly seen as an equal partner in development planning, financing, etc. cetera. Uh, private sector has particular strengths to bring uh, uh, to, uh, towards delivering the uh, SDGs, particularly uh, bringing in innovation, resource efficiency, but also provision of specific skills and, uh, importantly, resources as well. I would like to highlight the impact, uh, importance of impact investing 
as it can drive uh, long-term innovation and systems change by funding the development of market-based solutions to complex human problems. And particularly the emerging social enterprise models in the private sector creates positive social and environmental impacts that can address various SDG targets such as poverty alleviation, inclusive economic growth, uh, gender responsive actions, climate action, and also environmental preservation. Thank you very much, Chamindri. Uh, over to Renuka, DGPOI. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we know that globally, private investment is the engine of uh, growth of any economy. And the BOI, as the focal investment agency, plays a major role in attracting the foreign and local investments uh, that contributes towards the sustainable economic growth of the country, while creating skilled and niche job opportunities, generating export revenue, as well as transfer of technology and skills. From the inception, the BOI has received a cumulative foreign direct investment of 20 billion, and currently there are over 1,500 enterprises that operate under the BOI, providing employment opportunities to over 500,000 employees. It's also noteworthy that BOI Enterprises contributes towards 65% of national exports and 85% of national industrial exports. Projects with private investments have been the backbone that sustained economic activities in the country and which enabled continuation of industry operations even during challenging times the country faced recently. What we need now additionally is infusion of new capital into projects by way of private investments which would help Sri Lanka's recovery process. Investments uh, projects have enabled us to address some of the SDG goals, particularly on no poverty, gender equity, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, and industry innovation and infrastructure, which the BOI has consciously included into our corporate plan of 22 to 2026. So we are focusing very much on those SDG goals in the promotion of investments. BIO has also taken initiatives to promote investment to regions outside of the Western province with a view to uplift the livelihood of rural communities. Towards this end, establishment of export processing zones in recent times have been positioned in the eastern, southern and northwestern provinces. Through this measure, we envisage to spur economic activities in those areas, not only through direct employment opportunities, but diverse spillover additional opportunities, be it into the food supply, transportation and logistics, security services, janitorial services, or any other ancillary activities which are required to carry out business activities. I believe the launch of the SDG Investor Map in Sri Lanka is most opportune and will help to boost awareness of investment in Sri Lanka to the global community, resulting in ability to attract more sustainable investments to the country. The BOI being a strategic partner in this process will utilize this service as a promotional tool to attract more investments to drive economic growth Thank you very much, Renuka. Um, I might throw now to Mr. Tyagaraja for your opening remarks. Thank you. So I'd like to make a couple of uh, observations. First is uh, the opportunity uh, of private sector investments to channel through the venture capital and um, startup uh, ecosystem. The reason behind that is today I think Sri Lanka enjoys probably one of the most vibrant startup ecosystems in this region, but still the formal financial sector tends to fight shy. And then if you really look at the, some of the elements of uh, startup, whether it's fintech, 
EduTech, HealthTech, RegTech, or even ESG, literally all these guys, most of these guys, they all aspire to eventually blossom into a unicorn. But before they get to that stage, I think this roadmap creates, uh, pretty much Sharan presented, literally in every one of those verticals, there is an opportunity for a startup to plug in and energize the ecosystem to do better. So also that gives a low cost opportunity for these startups to test their model in Sri Lanka before they look at going out and scaling up. So from a multi-perspective, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for the private sector to engage and energize this sector. The, the second point I'd like to make is uh, looking at, again, this, this whole thing gives an opportunity for the private sector to increase its awareness on resilience for climate risk. Because whatever, as we are looking at an economic recovery from this low point, whatever recovery we look cannot be devoid of uh, uh, managing climate risk. And I think by looking at this, starting from the individual firm level, whether it's with staff, whether it is with suppliers, supplier chains, it doesn't matter. Once you start to engage and improve the awareness of climate risk and how one uh, insulates and improves its resilience at the firm level, will then hopefully give an opportunity through an aggregation level for the entire private sector to align with the national framework and contribute at an aggregate level to improve the resilience from a climate risk point of view. So those are the two observations. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyagraja. I think these are points that we can pick up during the discussion as well. Um, Kamal, over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruni, and uh, thank you for inviting me to um, share my views here. Um, for the question about private sector's role in addressing Sri Lanka's uh, economic recovery and development, I, I would actually venture to say that um, it's almost entirely the private sector's role um, with the rest that, I mean, that is, and I will say why, but before I say that, I want to clarify that and don't mean that government doesn't have a role. Government has a very clear policy role to facilitate that. Uh, that is very crucial. But why I say um, the private sector's role is, is, is huge, uh, I see the current economic crisis largely a foreign exchange crisis. And, uh, and then when you break it up into essentially four areas, we need to improve, increase exports, we need to increase tourism, we need to reduce imports, and then finally we need to improve remittances. Um, so I think across the board, private sector, I think all of us would agree, has a huge role to play. Um, I would just comment on one in these opening remarks, which is on, on reducing imports. Now, this is a, is a tricky one. The government has um, you know, increased number of bans on or uh, additional custom duties on number of imports, which is sometimes a double-edged sword because some of these imports are necessary to uh, basically manufacture certain exports. They're necessary for tourism. But I think a, a clear area where we um, need to do better is in reducing our fuel imports, right? So you have the, the climate impacts, but it's just simply a overwhelmingly large part of our foreign exchange bill for the country. And, uh, and it's used for two things, right? One is electricity generation, and two is for transport. And um, so in the electricity generation side, um, and that is an area where we have not done well uh, in terms of both of a cost of production of electricity, as well as the choices of, uh, of fuel um, for transitioning to uh, imported hydrocarbons to uh, using indigenous sources of particular renewable energy. And uh, we have done small scale solar and wind, but we have not done them at a larger scale where they become very significant in our power generation space. And, and that is despite the fact that we have very good both irradiation levels and very good wind resources in the country. Um, so where we have failed there is, is in terms of being able to have the contracting environment, the policy environment, and to do it at a scale where we attract um, large scale 
um, global developers who can deliver this at a competitive cost. And I'm happy to delve into why, you know, on, on those aspects in detail. Um, but I want to touch on the other part, which is the transport, where we uh, are one of the countries where our private consumption of fuel is one of the highest, or among the highest in the world, and, and we need to reduce this. We need to transition more into public transport um, and, and reduce our consumption of fuel. I mean, I think a good case in point for us to learn is how Greece tackled with this issue recently by increasing their petroleum prices and then using the savings to basically improve their public transport. So we can, we can do well on both sides. It's, a, it's, you know, it's on paper very, very um, straightforward equation, um, but we need, that is where again policy part comes in, where we need to just implement that. So I'll, I'll post that. Thanks very much, Kamal. I think this is a point we will come back to uh, in terms of the policy environment. Yeah, just one thing I said, the yes. private sector has a huge role to play on, on both of those as well. It's uh, in, in, in doing that, yeah. Certainly, that's well recognized. Um, Jonathan, perhaps I'll move to you and then to Lavanya after that. Sure. Uh, so I also believe that in terms of the private sector, there's a huge involvement private sector has to do in terms of Sri Lanka. So it's gonna be in two pronged approaches. So one is in terms of investors, when it comes to investors, there's not a lot of investment opportunities in Sri Lanka, especially when it comes to financial vehicles. Most of the corporates, uh, if you look at globally or even regionally, even India, Bangladesh, they have a lot of corporates have their own venture capital arm. Like even if you look at Unilever, Nestle's, they have a lot of arms. But in Sri Lanka, there are no, the corporates are not setting that up. That'll, that's also not uh, triggering the entrepreneurship culture and there are no investments going into that space. And the same way, the banks or the financial institutions are not looking at fi innovative financial instruments. So if you look at globally and regionally, there are lots of innovative financial instruments. Uh, like if you look at in the renewable energy sector, there is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's not much of renewable energy projects or cash flow back receiver securitizations done in Sri Lanka. So that's the immediate opportunity and you don't need to draw in foreign investments into Sri Lanka. You can use, the local banks can do. If I'm not mistaken, if it was NDB who did one some years back, which was a wind power securitization, but that was the only one done so far. So there's a huge opportunity in, in that space. The same way in the entrepreneur's bucket as well, the entrepreneurs also has to look at it in an innovative way because entrepreneurs are also going the traditional route by raising capital through debt or traditional equity. There's a lot of catalytic debt instruments available for impact enterprises, which is available in the market, like impact link bonds, impact link instruments, which is still not privy to Sri Lanka, not a lot of people are also looking at that. So I feel that you don't have to look at foreign investors, but there's local instruments which can be harnessed and there'll be a lot of opportunities here. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I think the role of innovative financing is something we need to discuss further going forward, but thanks for that. Um, Lavanya, uh, I know you're joining us online. Uh, opening remarks. Yes, thank you so much for having me, uh, albeit online. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. So just in response to your question, Dilani, uh, like the speakers before me, I'd reiterate that the private sector is beyond uh, contention as an indispensable force for sustainable development. It, it, of course, sparks innovation, improves productivity and economic efficiency, and all creating jobs and growth needed um, in this kind of current scenario in the market. So with this current complex backdrop that we're seeing in uh, Sri Lanka, along with grappling with the sustainable development goals, the private sector will need to make unprecedented efforts doing new things um, it, it will have to sharpen focus on investment themes that are keen GDP growth drivers that we've heard our UNDP colleagues talk about, whether it's renewable, renewable energy, infrastructure, textiles, garments, food and beverages, who have traditionally been uh, GDP growth drivers for the country. Uh, but I think a little shift in, in terms of the perspective as well on how the private uh, sector needs to perceive itself. They need to perceive themselves as partners in achieving these SDGs, uh, not just to further their business, but to work towards nation building and planet con uh, conservation. Um, you know, it's simply not enough to focus now on minimizing harm or doing less bad as a business entity. Uh, but, you know, in terms of even the narrative today, which is focused on sacrifice and scarcity, which is associated with impact and development, 
that is very unfortunately uninspiring for for profit enterprises um and it has also created a kind of polarization as well as an apathy in the market instead we need to transform this into an economic system towards one that is regenerative equitable and operates within planetary boundaries uh, as was said in an article so uh, for change to be sustainable we're also seeing world over the role of private capital with a purpose getting more and more poignant however in an environment which is high risk it's a volatile capital market uh, the environment needs to be made conducive and i think here is where i'll probably play up the point that kamal uh, said in passing in terms of the role of the government to make it enticing for private capital as well um, and in this you know how you know you can truly make it sustainable with strong collaborations across various constituents of what we call at abp and the continuum of capital so whether it is philanthropists impact funds government dfis corporates or any form of capital providers and that is where i think the poignancy turns into urgency right so in our observation there is an increasing trend of uh, in innovative finance instrument instruments that i think jonathan just mentioned uh, public private partnerships that are encouraging private sector investments and pursuing outcome based procurement and finance with social and environmental impact objectives um so i think this panel should be interesting in servicing what those platforms models and avenues are for private sector engagement in playing this critical role uh but i think we should talk about more on the blended finance impact bonds and harnessing really the msme power that is there in uh, sri lanka locally which is indigenous to the market i'll pause there thanks very much uh, lavanya certainly some uh, important points that we will be picking up uh, as we move along um to kick us off with the questions uh, we will have questions coming uh, online as well so i will pick them up as we go um and any questions from the audience please do uh, raise your hand and uh, we will have a microphone across to you uh but to kick us off um we know that the sri lankan government recently uh presented the voluntary national review uh of 2022 of the sdg progress in the country um and shamindri i'd like to ask you to maybe pull out some of the key recommendations from the vnr review and link it to some of the findings of the map that we had uh, presented today and think about how private investment can really support uh, the sdg trajectory of the country in recovery and development over to you um thank you durali uh, when um uh, actually when we conducted the vnr uh, we um have very clearly highlighted some of the macroeconomic challenges and i think they are very much known uh, low, low foreign reserves high government debt substantial fiscal budget deficit high inflation particularly food inflation now these will have far reaching impact on our sdg progress and creates additional challenges for mobilizing adequate financing for development which is probably the greatest challenge that sri lanka is facing uh, in achieving the sdgs as presented earlier as cap has estimated in 2019 that sri lanka needs to spend an additional 9% of the gdp per year to achieve the sdgs by 2030 and this has certainly widened since then um during the vnr process we also observed that there is a rising levels of inequalities in the country um in 2021 the world bank has estimated that around 500000 people have fallen under the poverty line at usd 3.2 per day which uh, causes the poverty levels to increase from 9.2% in 2019 to 11.7% in 2020 because of the job losses in the informal sector which employs around 60% of the labor force there's also widening disparities in income uh due to the rise of urban rise in urban poverty and poverty among vulnerable groups and disparities in access to basic needs such as cooking fuel drinking water etc uh particularly among the population aged over 65 this means that uh, additional public spending needs to be channeled towards social 
protection flows and social safety nets. And this was actually one of the recommendations of the VNR, is to focus on um, our social strengthening our social protection systems. Now, in a context where there is limited fiscal space in the national budget, increased private investment can free up scarce public resources for spending in immediate welfare measures, such as cash transfer programs. And uh, increased availability and improved access to alternative sources of energy, such as fuel, would be critical to ensuring that the basic needs of the people are met. And I'm glad that the renewable energy sector has been identified as a priority investment opportunity area, particularly solar power generation, wind power generation, and biomass uh, fuel manufacturing. Um, in addition to addressing the basic needs, I think investing in renewable energy would also help support uh, our economic uh, growth process, particularly transitioning towards a manufacturing economy based, based on export value addition. Um, secondly, I want to focus on uh, access to food, food security and nutrition. Now, even prior to the onset of the pandemic and the economic crisis, we um, are under nutrition and malnutrition levels among the children, particularly among the children, were re relatively high. So financing for nutrition interventions would be a key challenge in the upcoming years. Uh, and in addition, rising food cost in the backdrop of uh, declining productivity in the agriculture sector, uh, and of course, uh, shortages of essential goods, access to nutrition will be constrained, especially for the, those under the poverty levels. Now, VNR has recommended very clearly multi-sectoral approach and multi-stakeholder partnerships to address the nutrition-related challenges. So there is a significant potential for technology infusion in the agriculture sector through private sector partnerships that can be explored as measures to support income growth and ensure food security. Um, I saw uh, in the investor map presented earlier that food and beverages sector is a prioritized investment opportunity area, particularly um, R&D facilitation and services and farm digitization and mechanization uh, building up of uh, uh, storage, uh, logistics and storage facilities, etc. Um, and going beyond, uh, I also want to focus on uh, some key uh, findings of the VNR with regard to the health sector. Um, we uh, need to build the resilience of the healthcare system to face the emerging threats such as non-communicable diseases and new infections such as COVID-19 and re-emergence of old infections such as tuberculosis. And uh, the public spending on health has been, uh, although consistent with the average lower middle income countries health expenditure of 4%, uh, is lower than that of upper middle income uh, countries health expenditure of 5.9%. Uh, so, however, um, the country's healthcare infrastructure development requires additional funding to meet those challenges such as uh, non-communicable diseases, etc. And I'm glad that uh, the healthcare sector, particularly biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, as well as healthcare service delivery, has been identified as priority investment opportunity area. Then uh, there also needs to be additional invest financial flows towards the digital economy, uh, particularly to facilitate um, uh, digital government and digital economy, digital public uh, service delivery, etc., uh, to transition uh, Sri Lanka to a, a technology-based uh, society. Now, innovative financing such as sustainable green public equity um, and impact investments can fund projects with positive social and environmental impacts. They can also help uh, advance inclusive and sustainable business models that are imbued with social values and notions of responsibility and that uh, can, those that seek commercial success alongside more sustainable approaches and positive development outcomes. This means uh, the importance of, um, this emphasizes the importance of promoting businesses that look at fair and beneficial business practices towards labor uh, and the community. 
and businesses that look at uh, environmental practices as well uh, and trying to minimize ecological impacts in all areas from sourcing raw materials to production processes and shipping and administration. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chamindri. I think you clearly outlined, and the VNR, of course, uh, clearly captures some of the key areas uh, where investment is required. Um, and the challenge now is really to look at how we can mobilize some of that private capital towards these investments. Um, in that regard, I would actually like to pose the next question to the Board of Investment to ask um, uh, perhaps to tell us a little bit about your, uh, you know, uh, targets in terms of FDI. Um, as well as how um, the Board of Investment is supporting um, social uh, investing, social and environment uh, uh, linked investments. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, uh, Renuka? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you may be aware, the overall target of the BOI is focused on uh, contributing towards the economic growth of the country uh, by attracting FDI and creating employment opportunities as well as increasing the export revenue and developing infrastructure in terms of being able to give ready-made industrial blocks that can be used by investors when they come over to do their projects. In terms of the FDI targets we have set for this year, it is a one billion in, in USD that would be realized that the funds would have come into the country and been committed by the investors. In terms of the approvals, we are targeting to approve projects to the value of 2.2 billion. And um, I'm happy to say that as of the first half, we have, re we have been able to achieve uh, our targets, even overachieve our targets. And I believe we will be on track to to reach those targets, which in turn will create the, the environment for other investors to come in and also provide opportunities for our skilled workers to find employment. Um, we are also targeting to increase our export revenue from 9.2 billion this year. It was 8 billion last year and we hope to increase. We have also seen a growth in our exports. And um, I don't know, I mean, during these challenging times, everyone had doubts whether industries could sustain, but I'm really happy to share that most of our investors have been very steadfast and they have been even growing, uh, particularly in the IT sector. We've seen a lot of growth. And similarly, in other industrial manufacturing sectors also, we have seen growth. So indirectly, we are supporting the SDG goals in that sense. Um, and also another initiative we are focusing on is to have another additional 225 acres of ready-made industrial lands ready for investors. Uh, the BOI has 14 export processing zones. And on top of that, uh, because of the demand and in order to make it easier for investors to come and set up rather than looking for lands outside, which would take time and uh, which would require approvals from multiple agencies, uh, the BOI facilitates industrial lands where the zoning, the approvals in terms of your building plans and your permits, everything is done by the BOI. And these zones are also uh, given, conferred the environmental protection licenses. So the investors do not have to go around looking for these specific approvals. Um, in terms of uh, the sectors that we have identified, we have a couple of priority sectors, uh, which include the export-oriented manufacturing, import substitution, high-tech, uh, modernized agriculture, integrated waste management, to name a few. And we are actively pursuing to promote these, which, again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we want to take it out to the regions so that we will be able to provide opportunities to the communities uh, outside of the Western province, because we see a lot of concentration of industry in the Western province but we want to see that it spills over into the other regions as well. 
So in order to attract uh, investments into these uh, target sectors, the initiatives that we've taken is to really focus on the streamlining of business approval processes and the facilitation. So it's the investment facilitation is the main key that we are looking at. So um, I would also like to say in my experience, uh, whenever I have uh, been on foreign missions and met with investors, most of them would ask me, okay, what is the project you have in hand? Um, how much would it cost and what would be my return, etc. Uh, unfortunately, we, do, we did not have such structured projects to offer. And I see the great opportunity after seeing Shiran's uh, presentation today, where we will be able to use this uh, investor map in our promotion efforts and be able to offer investors particular projects where they have, where an analysis has already been done, where the financials have been looked at. So it's definitely going to be a plus for us, and uh, we're waiting to use it in our, in our future promotion drives. Thank you very much for that, and uh, certainly we look forward to uh, our ongoing partnership with uh, the Board of Investment growing uh, in that respect. Um, I might step uh, outside of Sri Lanka a little bit and uh, look at global and regional best practice. And uh, Kamal, I know from your experience, you've uh, worked quite a bit in the region, especially in the energy sector. And looking at some of those business models, if you could maybe elaborate some of the best practices or lessons you think would be relevant to Sri Lanka, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure, Dorani. Just uh, before I actually answer that question, I want to comment on something you asked before about commenting on um, what uh, the, in, the investor map has presented. And uh, actually, I think it's, uh, it's coincidental, and, and it's not coincidental because you've done a lot of background work for this. Uh, the, uh, the areas that are selected, I think, are areas uh, that we have approached and we have analyzed in Sri Lanka and looked at as and seen as focus areas. So um, the, you know, some of the areas that I specialize on renewable energy, waste management, um, logistics in terms of last mile delivery, cold chain storage. Um, so these are areas that we have identified as um, particularly uh, focus areas for Sri Lanka, but uh, that, I, that I work on, but other areas include um, the using digital platforms to enhance access of farmers to getting their products to market. Um, the um, obviously, uh, things to you know, export-oriented uh, industries and apparel are, are key um, focus. Has been key focus areas. Um, so I think I think um, it's uh, it's actually terrific work and and uh, in identifying these. Uh, and I think it's um, fortuitous for Sri Lanka that these actually, even if you took the sustainability part out, these are indeed economically the focus areas for Sri Lanka. And it happens to be sustainable as well, and hugely sustainable. Um, so um, the one comment I would add in the, on the white spaces, I didn't see, and maybe it's in the details, is the transport and public transport. And, and there, obviously, there is a public policy gap that needs to be addressed. Uh, but the sustainability angle is huge in terms of bringing, enhancing public transport, reducing private transport, uh, and, and the environmental ill effects of that. So. Um, that's at the, at the high level commenting on, on um, what you know, all of you um, and Shiran presented. Answering, I think, your question, uh, Dulani, the, and, and building on where I stopped before, on the, particularly on the renewable energy space, um, you know, Sri Lanka has done well in getting started on renewable energy, um, particularly mini hydro uh, at the small scale has been a model example, even regionally, if not globally. But where we have failed is to translate that into a larger scale where it then becomes, you know, makes a difference in, in the larger energy provision of the country, where still today, um, more than half of our electricity generation is hydrocarbon based and, and significantly dependent on imported fuels. So, um, so this is an in, enable to, uh, in order for us to increase our renewable energy foot, footprint, we have to do projects at a larger scale. Um, and, uh, you know, we have been doing projects 10 megawatts or less, which means that we are not attracting the larger players who can offer uh, lower cost tariffs in this space. And in order to uh, be able to attract 
larger players regionally, globally, we need to um, use contractual templates that are considered internationally bankable. And, and actually, the, the transition to do that is, is not huge. We don't really have to do much more uh, than what we are giving. But it's just, you know, some of them are just giving some comforts that we are providing but not putting on the contract. Uh, so the government of Sri Lanka has been backstopping CEB um, for the last 30 years and writing checks for CEB, but kind of saying, okay, we will, we will support that, that um, putting that on contract, uh, putting things like what are considered termination payments. Um, so these are legal things that international financiers and international developers look for, um, but it's just not on the contract. Um, so, you know, people will, investors will look for these, and if it's not there, they will not venture into, into these projects, and then offering them at a scale that is, is worthwhile the cost of coming to Sri Lanka. So 10 megawatts is too small uh, for, a, for a large developer to come in and, and put in the investment time and then the cost that they would incur. And uh, so we've been doing a lot of you know, 10 megawatts or less projects, but if you can offer a few 30, 50 megawatt projects, then it becomes significant enough for larger developers to come in and then and offer that. So, um, so, I mean, I'll give you a good example where IFC uh, two years ago uh, facilitated large-scale solar in Uzbekistan, which had not hitherto done uh, private or, or large-scale solar. And we were able to help them get tariffs of about uh, uh, three or four US cents a kilowatt hour. And in, in Sri Lanka, historically, while of course some of the historical tariffs have gone down from a US dollar cents, when they were awarded, the best we achieved were about eight to 10 US cents a kilowatt hour. So, um, so this is where we can actually make a significant mend on where we are on the energy equation by getting um, not only renewable and cleaner energy, but also getting it at a competitive cost. So. Thanks very much, uh, Kamal. I think a couple of points to uh, pick up from what you just said. Um, and I think uh, that links very well to some of the other questions I had to the panelists. Um, this perennial issue of um, being unable to scale up some of the, the really good business models, what the, the barriers are to that and some of the triggers that uh, are required to, to uh, make these business models grow. I think Mr. Tyagaraja also picked up on it previously to say that Sri Lanka, in fact, is, is a good breeding ground for pilots, but then what happens next? And um, I think that's maybe a question I might put to you, Jonathan, because I know that IIX has been looking at Sri Lanka as one of its key markets um, to think about really what some of these triggers and barriers might be for enterprises growing and scaling up and um, how we could potentially support that as, as the government, as development partners, and as the private sector. Sure. Uh, so if you look at Sri Lanka, we have a population of about 20 million or 22 million. So if you look at in terms of market space, uh, that's the maximum uh, product or service can go into. So nobody, we've come across most of the startups or enterprises are looking beyond Sri Lanka. They are always in the island mentality where they are looking at the Sri Lanka only market space. So I think most startups in Sri Lanka have to go beyond Sri Lanka. They need to think beyond Sri Lanka as well. And when it comes to instruments as well, the same way, when it comes to startups, they need to look a different instruments in the market space as well. Currently, there are not, a, not a, everybody thinks it's only the tech space which is very savvy. But if you look at agricultural space, there's lots of uh, ability to raise money as well. If you look at uh, globally, there are countries like Philippines, Bangladesh, which is already pure play agricultural companies who's raising money through carbon credit exchanges. So Sri Lanka still doesn't have anything of that sort as well, which the government should definitely lobby because that's the up and coming spectrum as well. I know Singapore is going to launch a carbon credit exchange as well, which Sri Lanka can definitely uh, leverage on because we have a huge space of agricultural land and it doesn't always have to be tech enabled. And one of the other things is uh, we have huge number of accelerators, incubators in Sri Lanka. But when it comes to startups, a lot of them struggle when it comes to capital raising. They don't know what kind of instrument to use, how to raise money. A lot of them are not aware of catalytic debt instruments, which is very famous globally and especially in the impact space, that's the way where impact enterprises raise money. And always when it comes to impact enterprises, everybody thinks, okay, the start, if you look at the current global macroeconomic perspective, the startup funding is going down in a huge way. But when it comes to impact enterprises, we see it very differently from IX because 
impact enterprises can actually raise money not only through impact funds or VCs, venture capitalist fund, you can actually raise money through foundations. You can raise money through angels who are on a more philanthropic ground. So there are lots of instruments. Now there are a lot of instruments going around the world and especially in India, which is picking up, which is called revenue-based loans. So which is still not in available in Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lankan banks plus entrepreneurs plus enterprises have to think more creatively. There's a lot of opportunity there for them to raise money and at the same time trigger their impact goals also into some of these instruments as well, which some of these investors or enterprises might be willing to invest in your business. So I think when you're scaling up, it's always good to look beyond Sri Lanka, not just uh, uh, our country as well. And the same way, if you look at the startup ecosystem in Sri Lanka, 92% of the startups funded in Sri Lanka are based out of Colombo. What happens to the balance 8%? So balance 8%, I think it's very limited. So I think the ecosystem has to be developed for the regional level players. Because if you look, look, go to Batiklo, if you go to Jaffna, there is not a lot of availability of funding or no, nobody knows even how to even raise money. Nobody even knows what equity even is. So which is a very sad situation in the country. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, that last point is actually a really good segue into maybe a question to Mr. Tyagaraja. Um, I know we've been having conversations about this previously as well in terms of uh, regional, uh, regionally based startups, uh, some of the success stories as well as the challenges. Um, perhaps you'd like to add something on that? So while recognizing what Jonathan says, to some extent I tend to differ also, Jonathan, because maybe from the convention and what is publicly available, there is limited opportunity, but what is not told, I think is a is a bigger story to also be. Uh, and I think while the BOI I think speaks about FDIs and we speak about attraction, when a country gets into trauma, before the quality of capital actually flows in, the confidence has to come in, right? So as a first step, before we try to look at the big ticket stuff coming in, we look at connectivity, and I think we we do have a significant diaspora out there who have gone either the 60s and also a whole new outflow went out post 83. And, and that lot, the next generation has really made a mark in literally every segment, be it government, private sector, tech, medical, universities, etc. So it's a question of how will you engage them. Right now, speaking about FDIs, if you look at the pre-FDI opportunity. I can give you a couple of examples. I mean, we can have an entire forum on this, but if I give you a few examples of how guys are leveraging the talent in Sri Lanka and helping to create some value here, but the business is somewhere else. Right? So you have a guy who went out 30 years ago from Peradeni University, today who is sitting in Plaston in, in, the, in, in uh, the West Coast, the guy sells interior design solutions using AI to the entire Canadian market, not the Sri Lankan market, but to the white Anglo-Saxon market, but the designing is done in Jaffna. That's just one example, right? I don't think the guy came with all due respect to uh, the BUI, right? Uh, if you hear of the brand, the VSS Arak, have you heard of VSS Arak? the Palmyra Iraq, you will not get it south of uh, Kilonshi, right? The guy came from Montreal about 20 years ago, an engineer, he set up the processing, he uses about a thousand toddy tappers in the north, from Palais north onwards, everything is pushed out into the US, US, uh, UK and Australia. I don't think, he, I, I, have, I have spoken to the guy, and ask him, have you gone to the BUI? Have you come and asked for funding locally? So he smiles and says, no, I don't need funding. If I'm allowed to do my job, I'll, I'll produce and I'll export. <laughs> right? There's another guy in Palais on the A9 road who is literally outsourcing every possible coconut grower in that Palais belt and he's making processing peat. He's a Wall Street guy. He's based in the Wall Street. He sends everything out of the US. So he, what he brings is in addition to the market access, the, the knowledge on compliance standards and what one needs to do to get the product into that market. So I think, I think 
there are enough examples like that where the connectivity is still there and very strong. You speak about also the lack of support for startups. If you look in the in Canada, the the holy grail of startups is Waterloo University, right? But amongst the real startups, the, the incubator, Ryerson is today one of the most aggressive uh, incubators among the universities, right? The, the two units in Toronto are headed by Sri Lankan Tamils, or guys who grew up from here, young guys, all in their 30s. They come to Sri Lanka, they are looking at people to maintain support. So there is enough connectivity like that available. It's about how we engage, and I think this is a superb opportunity. All this time they have been doing it at random, but here there is a story, I think for Dulani and I think your team, this is an excellent opportunity to also showcase this roadmap to some of these guys to say there is another, now there is an organized proper framework for you to come and look. But they, actually if you look deep enough, there is enough out there. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Tyagaraj. I think linking some of those uh, regional business opportunities to the findings of the map will be really interesting. But also you brought out the very important element of uh, the support of diaspora, um, Sri, Sri Lankans overseas who are a big part of, uh, can be a big part of the recovery process uh, of the country. Um, I'd like to step back again. I know Lavanya has been uh, joining us online and waiting patiently. Um, uh, AVPN, as, as a global network, also has uh, extensive experience in impact investing. And uh, I wondered if you could share some of the key lessons from uh, the region as well as your experience in Sri Lanka as well. Thank you, Dilani. And uh, it was very interesting to hear the other panelists. And I'd like to respond to one of the observations made. But I, I do think that the solution lies in uh, making it more attractive for investors, both local and foreign. But if we are to get that kind of uh, increased exponential uh, attention to the market externally, we will need to create a lot of uh, confidence building internally in the market. And I was just looking back on a few of the things that uh, organizations have been enabling and we come in through the ecosystem building lens. So the kind of things that are encouraging uh, investments locally. I think one of the things that uh, in our observation is a deal sourcing support, right? Uh, I think um, a co-panelist has just mentioned a few organizations out of the local knowledge of having uh, a full awareness of the market. But if in the ecosystem building effort, whether it's a combination of government plus intermediaries, et cetera, to be able to give that deal sourcing support, uh, enable co-investment opportunities, advise on deal structuring, technical assistance, where you can put together programs, uh, giving them advisory services. So small organizations, which Jonathan referred to as well as being unaware on the whole impact language. So to be able to make them ready for the kind of uh, seed funding that they might be looking for. So early stage funding, which could, you know, arguably can be provided by the government so that the initial phase of the risk can be taken off from the organization as well as the prospective investors, whereas the VCs, et cetera, could come in in the growth stage of the investment, right? These are just ideas, uh, experiences from other uh, models that we are seeing. And also in terms of creating this whole <clears throat> entrepreneurship development uh, program for organizations to create a sense of uh, maybe platforms like competitions which will enable them to be ready for investments, create the whole jargon, the, uh, the vocabulary of impact investment, so to speak, or to be able to give them networking opportunities. Um, you know, one of the most cost effective ways is for a peer to peer learning in capacity building, if we're able to increase that. I think all of these are uh, in a way capacity building for organizations to be investment ready. And it's something that uh, I think we could explore. Thanks very much, Lavanya. I think there are quite a few lessons we can uh, learn from the region and we will be in touch, uh, no doubt, uh, even after this conversation with you. 
Um, I'd like to open the floor um, to any questions uh, from the audience here present in the room. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in online, which I can pick up on. Um, any questions can be directed to any of the panelists. Uh, we also have the UNDP team here, and uh, Shiran Fernando and the Ceylon Chamber team, the research team, if you have any specific questions on the map. If you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you. I'm Darshika, Director Planning Road Development Authority. Uh, actually, uh, it, this is a very good eye-opener for the investors. Now here, each and every map, it is stated that IRR rate of returns. Now everybody can take a quick decision on that one. But in the meantime, as Mr. Kamal said, now there is a white space regarding the transport sector. Now it is high priority for us to go for the, uh, especially for the public transport sector has to be developed uh, mainly in the uh, railway lines. So, but uh, here it is not stated in that one. And also in the world trend is the public partnership, PPP system has to be introduced this one. Uh, in that point of view, PPP systems, government also has a major role on that one because infrastructure development has to be provided for that one. And also we have to identify some sort of uh, road sectors also into this map. Now it is. It may be. It it uh, it it may not uh, fall into the short term or medium term. Basically, it goes to the ten-year plan, uh, long-term plan. But I think. But in Japan now there are so many railway lines in private sectors owned by the private sectors, integrated entire lines, and they are providing very good uh, transport. Uh, plan for the entire country. And also, I think if we can state now, there are at the country like this in crisis situation, we have to sign certain things at now itself, and we, we have to go for the investments, as well as we'll have to think about the long-term system also. But I think uh, better we will include such things also into this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your suggestions. Uh, and indeed, the transport sector was uh, an area we looked at as part of our white spaces. Um, just um, maybe, Shiran, I wonder whether you'll be able to respond quickly to that question. Um, could we have a microphone here, please? On the potential of the transportation sector. And Thanks. Yeah. That was a sector. So we had about nine sectors that we really prioritized at the start, uh, maybe around April. And then we really re-looked re at um, from the priority segments and, and from a 12-month perspective. Railway was one of the ones we looked at and, and electrification of railway and so many other things. But we just felt the opportunity for the private sector and maybe some of the financing mechanisms some, uh, and maybe also a bit of the regulations were not favorable towards, uh, towards uh, the private sector. And um, there was also, I think, a lack of maybe uh, business models existing within the sector, within the country as well, towards this. We've seen like on and off private sector coming in and, and not you know, having continuous kind of investment as well. But I think today's budget, for example, uh, the president has mentioned uh, the railway um, uh, electrification on, on a particular line as well. So I think maybe that can be a pilot project to kind of get more investment in the sector. Uh, but definitely, I think that's a space for uh, the multilaterals as well, and maybe private financing to eventually come in uh, as well. But it's not a sector we forgot about. Uh, similarly, I think another question would be on, on leisure as well, and tourism, but there as well, we felt a lot of the capacity and, and the room inventory and certain uh, offerings that Sri Lanka had uh, are still there, and I think now the case is kind of to get more tourists to come in here. But maybe 12 months down the line, when tourism does pick up, maybe we can relook at those uh, sectors as well. Yeah. Thanks. And just to add to that, I think Shiran previously pointed out that the SDG investor map is is not a static tool; it's a dynamic tool. So we will be updating the findings on a periodic basis. 
Um, just maybe coming back quickly to one question on financing, because this has come up quite a lot uh, during the conversation, and I uh, wonder whether uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Tyagaraja, whether you would like to um, add something on that. Um, uh, we know that uh, the Sri Lanka landscape is not a uh, standard uh, landscape for investment at the moment, so it's something uh, that will require a lot of sort of blended financing options, looking at concessional and non-concessional financing options, and perhaps maybe Kamal also would like to come in on this. Um, so, uh, is there a role for development partners to play? Is there a role for the UN and, and other multilaterals to play? Um, and uh, what are some of the initiatives that are currently underway? Thanks. So, if I look, I mean, I'll leave Kamal to talk on the renewable side, but if we look at environment per se, I think that it's still a un vastly untapped opportunity in Sri Lanka, given the, the ocean around us and the land in the country, but they, I, I know that Ramindri has done a reasonable amount of work on that and I think also contributed to the green taxonomy document to the central bank. But I think personally there needs to be much more engagement to improve the awareness of the key stakeholders in government and especially in this juncture when we have gone out of the markets and we are conventional fine funders will always look at the rating and say what is, what needs to be done to get back into a rateable, a bankable solution. The sensitivity to climate uh, with the type of impact investors and the development partners, in my opinion, gives a very clear opportunity to go beyond ratings and look at the uh, part of the balance, national balance sheet which is not really leveraged by right, the nature. And I think uh, while, while some conversations have started, I think there needs to be constant engagement with the government to show them the value and the low-hanging fruit to, to work parallelly with the various conventional financial opportunities that are going on. Um. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Thea said, and just to add to that, I think, um, so we are now advanced in the process of IMF dialogue and the restructuring. I think that's a key part of sort of unlocking the, or reopening the financing toolbox for many multilaterals as well. Um, but as Thea said, I think a key part where, you know, multilaterals and other many, many other financiers and other sorts of blended financing will sort of push over the edge is, is having these climate and sustainability aspects built into it uh, because uh, that is a key motivator for many, many financiers. But I think what we can do is, um, is get started on that process now. Um, I mean, keying off what uh, the lady mentioned about you know, bringing in PPPs and structuring the PPPs. So, I mean, railway sector, for example, the, the railways, the lines itself is a more public investment, but the rolling stock is where the private sector can get involved in, and that takes a bit of time. But I think on the transport is not only railways, there's uh, just buses. I mean, there is, uh, you know, you can bring in a number of buses and make, you know, public transportation more convenient, and that is something you can do very readily in a very short time span within, you know, three to six months. And, and that can be done and streamlined with, uh, with significant private participation as well. Um, but the policy environment does need to come in with a, with a clear vision on that to, to progress. And this is again, I want to say on the PPP front where we have not done significantly um, compared to actually what we did about in, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we made some good progress in PPPs and, and we sold there. Uh, so some of the first um, port PPPs for some of the first um, uh, power PPPs but we failed to take that structure beyond, and, and uh, we are now lagging. We were pioneering in the, in the region at that time. Now we are behind in the region where we need to pick up there, and that's where we can bring in large quantums of financing from the multilaterals, from, from the bilaterals, in a, in a competitive manner. And, uh, and, and that is something we need to now prepare now so that we can get and draw the financing once some of the restructuring work is done uh, in short order. Thanks a lot uh, for that comment. Um, just checking if there are any further questions from the audience. 
Yes. One more question. Hi. Hello, I'm Ratika from uh, Global Compact. Just a question on, uh, before that, let me congratulate you for a fantastic job here. It's really, uh, I would say that uh, this may be just the first step, but it would certainly evolve into being something magnificent for this country. Um, just a question, as we talked about food security, I realized that you had also talked about supply chain, and that was interesting. But I just wanted to know whether you took considered if uh, consumption and the geographic areas where, for instance, the Western province still is where the highest consumption of food is. And uh, today we need to look at uh, possibly affordability as well as accessibility. And we are still depending on the rural farmers to produce for the Western province. And then we're trying to transport it here. There is also a huge wastage, and this is adding to the cost as well. But have you looked at possible opportunities within uh, the province, and maybe immediately just outside the Western province, because consumption is going to increase, taking into account that the port city is also going to happen, whether we like it or not, and the that would also add to the consumption, and it is growing. Uh, have you looked at maybe modern technology for farming, urban technology for farming, maybe in the western province? We have lots of uh, warehouse space that is still available in and around here, and we can possibly look at that for uh, vertical farms and other modern farming technology, which is also not vulnerable to climate change. So therefore, there is greater security there and it's possibly going to make it to the market a lot faster and also with less spoilage. I just wanted to ask you whether that was discussed in any form. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Ratika, for that question. This is certainly an area we looked at, and I wonder, Shiran, would you like to add something on that quickly? Uh, we need to wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the area we looked at is on improving the supply chain to get it into the urban regions and kind of reduce uh, post-harvest losses and things like that. So that's where um, solutions like the cold chain storage in different parts um, of the country have been identified. Um, also technology kind of to improve yield and productivity. On your specific focus area, I think that's something we can uh, look at. But I think you, you mentioned certain land availability, but sometimes land is also a constraint uh, within the Western province as well. So maybe that's something we can look at uh, very specifically going forward. Uh, it could even, be, I mean, there's a lot of things happening with home gardens and so many other uh, projects as well, but maybe there's something, a uh, solution that, that we can put together. Thanks for that, uh, Shiran. Unfortunately, we've got a message to say our time is up. This has been a very interesting discussion, and uh, no doubt we can go on for another couple of hours. Uh, but uh, perhaps to wrap up, uh, maybe I'll hand back to the panelists um, to uh, pick out maybe two key messages or takeaways that they would like to leave with us based on our conversation today, and particularly any recommendations to development partners such as UNDP in terms of how we can continue to support uh, in this area. Uh, so Chamindri, I might ask you to kick off. I think um, the um, role of private sector came out very strongly in, in, in uh, the SDGs process. Um, so. Um, SDG financing is also extremely important and uh, from the side of the Coun Sustainable Development Council, this is a new area for us and we have initiated some work uh, with the uh, private sector as well as, uh, you know, working on certain uh, systems such as, you know, working with Central Bank in um, operationalizing the Sustainable Finance Roadmap and building the capacity of uh, government as well as private sector stakeholders in, uh, in uh, innovative financing. Um, the key message is the, the importance of all stakeholders to work towards a common goal, um, to work towards a more sustainable path, 
and to the development partners to extend, you know, further uh, support to Sri Lanka in, uh, you know, building capacities to attract some of this innovative financing because I think that's uh, still we are at a very early stage, you know, and um, in comparison to even other countries in the region. Thank you. Chamendri. Uh, Mr. Tyagaraja? So two points. The first thing I think is to continuously engage the nine provinces or the eight other than the western province to also get them involved other than the center to make sure that these regional inequalities constantly addressed. I think that's very important. The second point is uh, in speaking about uh, non-conventional financing, especially today when uh, imports is a challenge and foreign exchange is a challenge and will probably continue to be a challenge for the next at least a couple of years. There is still very little uh, awareness of what we call non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and how that can play a role in supporting some of these things, whether it is solar, for example, today you can't import panels because there is a problem. But if you use the NFT solution to get someone to bring it and then exchange that for, say, carbon credit, there is always a possibility. But I think one needs to first engage so authorities in terms of awareness patients. So those are the two points I'd like to make. Thank you very much. Uh, Renuka? So, I would like to uh, just highlight that we have a couple of, uh, not many that have been put on the investor map, right, Shiran? We have about 30, you said, no? How many uh, structured projects that we are having up on, the, uh, on this portal? So yeah. I think this would be a good platform because many, like multiple agencies and ministries have projects in hand, but it is not out there for investors to know about. So this would be a good start to collect all of that, collate, and then do your analysis, and then with the market intelligence, put it out there. And as an investment promotion agency, we would be able to utilize it and share it with our commercial officers that are in our foreign missions as well. And uh, this will also supplement uh, and complement a partnership finder that we have, the BOI itself has introduced, where we are, we are having a platform for investors to reach out to anyone who wants to invest into their projects or go in for joint ventures. But that is an independent platform where it is not uh, structured in this sense. So it is up to each investor to list out what they are seeking. So I think this is a good start uh, and we should build upon it so that there is one uniform portal where any investor can look up to the projects that are available in Sri Lanka. Thank you and we very much look forward to uh, our market intelligence gathered here feeding into the broader work of the Board of Investment. Um, Kamal, over to you. Um, thank you. So I think in, in closing remarks I would say, well, A, I would repeat, I think uh, you guys have done a terrific job in terms of uh, um, sort of honing on in the focus areas, the IOAs as you have spelled out. Um, and and that's, uh, that's a good start. I think in terms of going forward and what I think UNDP and the partners can do is um, two things. One is I think in having identified these areas, I think there's still a bit of work to be done to incubate these and take it, make it ready to, for private investment. So, um, so I think there's some, if you can, deploy uh, some incubation funding to support and facilitate that process, I think that'll help uh, get it to where the private sector can come in. Um, two, I think, is uh, there is still a significant coordination role, even among the development partners and the government, that the UNDP um, and the partners can, can play to then take it forward. Um, so uh, to me, I think those are the two, two key areas to take it forward. One, one other comment I would make is, uh, you have a lot of good areas identified. You're not lacking in um, areas that are impactful and economically sound uh, that also happen to be very much in line with the SDGs. Um, so I would say uh, prioritize areas that have scale and volume or, or volume. Uh, ideally, if it's both, is there. there. But uh, so, for example, 
in renewables you will have scale, uh, but probably not as many projects. Uh, but if you look at things like uh, domestic biofuel solutions, that is not gonna have scale, but it'll have potentially volume. Um, so uh, I think uh, that'll help you pursue opportunities that are gonna be more private sector realizable than, than not. Thanks, Kamal, that's very good advice. Um, Jonathan, over to you. Yeah, so all these solutions are really great, but I see that there, is, there has to be both measurable financial and impact goals, so that way these goals can be tracked. That's a very important point when it, when it comes to foreign investors, especially impact funds, they look at the impact angle. So we need to make sure that these SDG goals, the impact measurement is tracked. And the second point is, of course, when you're getting the investors, I think you need to make sure that the investors are also aware of the global current climate in the country as well. So that's another aspect as well. And especially the private PPP partnership, especially when it comes to development agents as well, when you come, uh, when you're, if, example, if you're looking at a fund, there, there can be a lot of first loss guarantees where development agents can come in definitely into the country as well uh, as a support system. Thanks, Jonathan. Lavanya, last words to you. Yeah, when you go last year, this tends to be uh, a repetition, I, I would guess, but then and maybe also a reiteration. So coming in as an ecosystem builder and working with social investors across Asia, I'd, I'd definitely leave our audience with the need to make our uh, organizations more investment ready. And that means like, uh, you know, lending deal sourcing support or seed stage funding, networking opportunities, the whole gamut, which will essentially increase their relevance to investors. And I completely agree with Jonathan. The second point I was to make as well is the lack of data could really hurt us in this process. So ensuring that there are systems that are generating uh, accurate data, and then on the other side, having impact measurement that is able to reflect the organizations for the true value that they bring, I think would be very critical. And overall, the role of the government to make enabling systems for private sector engagement uh, whether it's to fund incubators, like Kamal mentioned, or whether it's enabling PPPs, it's supporting MSMEs and getting early stage funding, uh, possibly through requisite tax debates for angels or making it attractive for investors is what I'd leave the audience with. Thanks very much, Lavanya. Thanks. Um, I think this brings us to the end of the panel discussion component. It has been a very interesting conversation and my sincere thanks to all of the panelists uh, for taking a time out of your busy schedules to join us today. We will certainly be following up on many of these uh, threads that uh, we have drawn out today. Um, and uh, we will be moving on next uh, to uh, the section on uh, next steps. Um, so before I hand over to Marlene, um, over to you, Afra. Um, back to you to take uh, the proceedings forward. Thanks very much, panelists. Uh, we can uh, take our seats again. Thank you. Thank you, Dilani, and to all our panelists this afternoon. So our final intervention for this afternoon uh, would be the call to action and closing remarks by Ms. Marlene Hervig, the officer in charge of UNDP Sri Lanka. Marlene has 17 years of development uh, experience, international development experience, working on govern governance and peace building, as well as in management and coordination roles within the UNDP. Most recently, she served as the acting director for the UNDP Oslo Governance Center, and before that, as conflict prevention and peace building advisor, UNDP Regional Hub for Arab States in Amman, Jordan, where she also led the regional efforts on preventing violent extremism. So I now call upon Officer in Charge of UNDP Sri Lanka, Ms. Marlin Hervig, to deliver the closing remarks and the call to action. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a fantastic uh, event. Uh, I'm really pleased to see the SDG investor map launched. So allow me to thank our speakers, our panelists, distinguished participants, and uh, 
both uh, public and private sector and development partners. Thank you for coming here in person and to all of you who are online as well. This um, has marked uh, the end of a long journey, or it's the start of an even longer one, I hope, where we might see many iterations of uh, investment intelligence towards the sustainable development goals. Looking back at this journey that led to the creation of the Sri Lanka SDG Investor Map, I wanted to acknowledge the partnership and uh, the support that has made it possible. And some of that has been alluded to today, but I really want to spell out those who have been at the, at the center of the journey. I want to acknowledge, of course, the support of the Sustainable Development Council and the DG Shamindri Saparmando in particular. Together with UNDP, she has been the co-chair of uh, the core reference group for this whole exercise on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka. And this um, core reference group is another entity that I wanted to reference with its members that have guided uh, the process throughout. I'm not going to list out all the members, but very much thank you for having been critical, but also very pragmatic partners throughout this whole process. And one member we have heard from today, that's the BOI, as part of the core reference group, thank you very much, and also for the final validation of the map. We look forward, and as you already also said on, on the panel, to work closely together to see how we can maybe translate some of uh, the market intelligence to results and investments on the ground. I also wanted to thank uh, Deputy Secretary Treasury Priyanta Ratnayaka, who saw the value in the beginning of the exercise to start off the process and also to help to set it forward with the necessary approvals and, and uh, get it kicked off. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, the knowledge partner in this process, uh, Manuela De Silva, the cham Chamber of Chairman, and of course, Sharon Fernando, the research team leader. Thank you so much to you and the team behind the research. I wanted to thank the entire UN team, and um, uh, not the least, of course, uh, the resident coordinator, but also all our other partners. From UNDP, we have heard of, from our global and regional colleagues, and they have been a great part of this, so thanks to them. But uh, most, I wanted to say a thanks to my UNDP colleagues here in Sri Lanka. You have done a tremendous job to take this forward, in, in particular, Dulani and Afra. So really, thank you so much. In regards to taking us from where we are today to going forward, we see that it has been a collective effort and a true partnership between government, private sector, and then also the UN. We need to now see how we're going to translate this knowledge into action. The success will, of course, depend on uh, the partnership and the stakeholders in this room and online, but also others we need to engage many more private sector and investors for this to be a success in the implementation. Calling upon them and others for action, I actually think that the list of recommendations, the two each that we got from the panelists, are some that I really want to note down and, and share afterwards. Together, I mean, it was from coordination to looking at the regional inequalities, I mean, looking beyond the Western province in in Sri Lanka, looking at scale, being investment ready. I mean, there were a lot of good recommendations there that I really think that we should see how we can move towards as, as, a, as a guide for ourselves. We, we will continue our engagement with the government partners like Minister of Finance and, and BOI, because we did also hear the necessity of a favorable ecosystem and that there is the right policy framework in place 
for the investments that are needed. In terms of in impact investors, I uh, strongly encourage them and fund managers to consider these sectors and the investment opportunities from the SDG investor map. Because this is now the chance to make sure that these developments that focus on sustainability uh, and equality for the recovery of Sri Lanka make its way to the investment portfolios. I also want to call on the private sector to adopt the SDG impact standards. We, these are independent and global management standards that guide businesses and investors to make decisions in regards to economic, social and environmental standards. So to conclude, having reached for the government, the investors and the private sector and really thanked all the partners, I want to assure you of the continued support that UNDP will be playing in this process. Because for us, this is really about sustainability and an equitable recovery for Sri Lanka to make pro continued progress towards the SDGs, but also to ensure that there is not sliding back. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm very, very proud that we today launched the SDG Investor Map. So thanks to all of you for making that possible. Thank you. And that concludes this afternoon's event, marking the launch of the SDG Investor Maps for Sri Lanka, organized by the United Nations Development Program in partnership with the Sustainable Development Council and the Board of Investments. Thank you very much once again to our speakers, our panelists, and for our guests for taking time to join us this afternoon. A very special thank you to our partners, uh, Ms. Nadika Marasingha, Assistant Director from SD Council, our communications team, and all our service providers. And we are most uh, grateful for your continued support, and we are looking forward to continuing on this journey to achieve the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. We look forward to further engaging with the government, investors, private sector, donors, to identify practical avenues through which some of the findings from the map can be operationalized. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Refreshments have been served outside, so please help yourselves, and I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thank you.